Nun Eaton, the jewel of the South Midlands, the town who gave us such great men as George Eliot and Larry Grayson, the throbbing heart of this teeming metropolis, the pearl of the CV13 postcode, down by the roundabout and up the one-way system, is Nun Eaton Town Hall, where we can find none other than Nun Eaton's Mr. Entertainment. Hello ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, I'm Barry Tadcaster and this is my friend Ken Jevons who is an Orang Pendek. Hello, my name is Ken Jevons and I am an Orang Pendek. Unlike the other Orang Pendeks, I do not come from the Indonesian island of Sumatra. I come from the London borough of Lewisham where I am employed by Lewisham Town Council as an ombudsman. So Ken, what's happening in, uh, in today's show then? Well, in today's show, we are going to meet a superstitious loom fixer and he will whine and chant and pray all because he's scared the spooky dillos are coming to get him. We're also going to be looking at some small bells with curious uses. I really like the old queens. I'd just like to tell you all that Mother, who many of you know from the weird weekends and from this show, was taken to hospital on Friday. She is very frail, but appears to be stable, and I will let you all know what happens. Please remember her and us in your thoughts and prayers. My name's John Downs, I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune and Zoology, and welcome to the first episode of On the Track Extra. The other night, Richard and Carl Marshall were both here at the same time, which really doesn't happen very often, and so I gave them the chance to sit down, talk cryptozoology, while I pointed a camera in their general direction and got mildly involved as and when it seemed to be appropriate. We're going to show excerpts from these talks over the next few episodes. But to start off, here's Richard and Carl Marshall talking about the theories of Reinhold Messmer that the Yeti is actually a brown bear. Carl, what's this book you've been reading? Show it to the camera and tell us all about it. It's a book by Reinhold Messner, who is a mountaineer, a very famous mountaineer, probably the most famous mountaineer. Um, it's about the Yeti. So, yeah. <laughs> I hate to look on camera, you'll learn that quite quickly, Rich. So, what do you think about it? Uh, it's a good, it's a well written book. I don't really think his theory at the end is particularly viable. Um, he thinks the Yeti, the larger Yeti, is a brown bear, which is a bit of a cop out, in my, in my opinion. What do you think, Rich? Well, the thing about Ronald Messner is he keeps changing his tune. Back in the 90s, he wrote a piece for the Mail, the Daily Mail, about um, the Yeti, claiming that he'd seen several of them, including a, a female suckling a young and an adult male. And nowhere in his writing did he suggest that they were bears, and his description of them uh, was not in the least bear like. Also, um, John and I did a programme with Brian Blessed, the actor. Um, uh, Gordon's Alive! You know that fella. Yeah. Uh, a few years back, and we were talking about cryptozoology. In fact, we closed the BBC bar down. We drank, uh, Brian Blessed, myself, and John drank the BBC bar dry. I've heard the story. And, and he told us about Messner, who was a friend of his, and he, he, he was saying to him that he'd seen the Yeti and that. Uh, Brian asked him, oh, was, it a, was it a bear? And he said, no. So he keeps changing his tune. But there are various reasons why the Yeti can't be a bear. It's like trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole. Um, firstly, the Yeti habitually walks on two legs, which bears don't do. Uh, bears have scapula, um, the shoulder blades 
that face downwards like a, a quadruped. We have the scapula, the shoulder blades facing outwards because we're bipeds. That's why we have these broad shoulders. The Yeti has these massively broad shoulders. When a bear stands up on its hind legs, you see it has these round shoulders because the, the limbs are, are held down like that. They're not. Um, the, the Yeti has a flat, gorilla-like face. It doesn't have the snout of the, of, of the bear. Uh, it has the ears at the side, like a human being. It doesn't have ears at, at the top, like a, like a bear. And perhaps most tellingly of all, the Yeti can use tools. It has an opposable thumb. It will throw rocks. It can throw rocks and boulders. It can swing a club. And show me the bear that can do all of those things, and then I'll believe you. Because a bear that can do all those things is more fantastical than an unknown species of ape or a relic hominin. It's believed there are at least three types of yeti, correct? Yeah. There's a small one, the temle, which is similar to the orang pendek in size, and there's a man-sized one. Um, the smaller one has yellowish-brown fur. There's a, there's a medium-sized one, the, the mete, which has auburn-coloured hair. It's about the size of a man. And then there's the massive one, the, the zute. Um, hulking thing it mm. translates as. That's the eight to ten foot one. That's the one we think of when, when we say the word yeti. Yeah. So there may be three distinct species there, which isn't all that incredible. No. What do you think they are, the three species? Well, I think the smaller one may be a relative of the orang pendek, some sort of ape. The medium sized one may be um, a relative of the orangutan or it may be a relic hominin a uh, relative of one of the ancestors of man. The big one may be a surviving form of Gigantopithecus. Uh, I think that the the smaller Yeti type may be some sort of Langer. Um, I think the mid-sized type um, I think is probably some kind of primate and uh, I wonder whether or not the large type of Yeti may represent the uh, the most easterly range of the cave bear possibly um, the range of the cave bear that we know from the fossil record sort of heads down towards the Himalayas and I wonder because they often describe it as uh, a bear but not a bear and I wonder whether or not that might have something to do with it. All the people I talk to that seen the larger type of Yeti they describe it as looking like either a, a colossal man covered with black hair or a, a, a huge upright walking gorilla. Is it possible that the, the large type and the medium sized type um, could be mixed up together? Maybe, maybe, but they're, they're not seen together. But Yetis are very rarely seen in with more than one. There's been a couple of sightings when there, there have been two together. But they seem to be solitary animals, more like behaving more like a an orangutan than a gorilla or a chimpanzee in, in that they they um, are not gregarious. Yeah. I feel as if I am treading in the footsteps of great British explorers. And so I feel I must uphold these fine traditions. Wally the comedy rhinoceros, I presume. In the last episode of On the Track, Charlotte and I were talking about the Loch Ness Monster, and a discussion overran. So, here's some stuff that we didn't have room to put in. Like, what was the first sort of thing for the Loch Ness Monster? Well, allegedly, it goes down to an early saint called Saint Columba. You know, I've just said that weird coincidences happen. How many days are there in the year? 365, 366 in a leap year. Yep. So, you have a 365th of a chance for something to happen on one particular day. Okay. On my birthday, <laughs> honestly, on my birthday, in the year 565 AD, Saint Columba, who was a missionary who came to Scotland from Ireland where he'd been uh, trained by Irish monks, he came to 
Scotland to spread the word of Christianity. While he was travelling in Scotland, Columba had to cross the River Ness. On its banks he saw some of the picked folk burying a man who had been bitten by a water monster while swimming. The body had been pulled from the loch with the aid of a hook for rescuers who had come to his assistance in a boat to come too late. Despite the danger, Columba ordered one of his swallows to swim across the loch and bring back a boat that was moored on the other side. This man's name was Looney Mokharanen. Now, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I'm sure I've got it wrong, but once again, here is the spelling. But without hesitation, a Looney, or if that's how you pronounce his name, stripped the swim and plunged in. The monster, robbed of its earlier feast, surfaced and darted at Looney with a... I love the way it's actually, if it is pronounced loony, the fact this is a very strange story, um, featuring, on my birthday, featuring somebody called Looney is pretty cool. Uh, the monster darted at Looney with a roar, its jaws open, everyone on the bank was stupefied with terror, everyone except Columba. A firm believer in the authority of the crucified Christ, he raised his hand and made the sign of the cross, invoked the name of God and commanded the beast, saying, You will go no further and won't touch the man. Go back in once. Go back in once. Go back at once. You don't seem to keep that voice going. At the voice of the saint, the monster fled as if terrified, more quickly as if it had been pulled back with ropes. The heathen were amazed. Everyone who witnessed the sight gave glory, glory to the God of the Christians. And St. Columba appears to have then inducted them all into the early Christian church. There are various, various, various variations on this story, and quite a few of them that actually can be interpreted that actually Columba while he was crossing the River Ness, not the Loch Ness, actually came across a medicine man or a shaman from one of the local tribes and after a quarrel converted him to Christianity. It must have been some quarrel. But to answer your question, on my birthday, August the year 22nd. August 22nd, yes I didn't tell him that, August the 22nd, in the year 565, that's the earliest one. But the modern sightings of the Loch Ness Monster really started in the 1920s and 30s. We've only been able to unearth a couple of accounts of giant eels that grow bigger than four foot. But, of course, there is also the um, evidence that Richard Freeman and I unearthed when we were in the north of England about ten years ago, over ten years ago now. Bernard Hoisman once said that there were lost worlds everywhere. Well, I agree with him, but can you imagine one of these lost worlds with absolutely wonderful cryptozoological evidence, compelling cryptozoological evidence to be found at the top of Blackpool Tower Aquarium. Up Blackpool Tower in the seaside resort of Blackpool, up north. In Great. The, yeah, but can you imagine it? We travel all over the world looking for things, one of the best bits of evidence we ever find is in a glass tank at the top of the, at the, top of the Blackpool Tower. We were on our second trip to the Lake District where we've been following up stories of giant eels that have been seen both in Coniston Water and Lake Windermere. And for reasons that I truly can't remember anymore, we ended up in Blackpool, which I've always thought was a horrible place. But we went up to the Blackpool Tower Aquarium and, like I said just now, you wouldn't believe in all my trips around the world I have believed that Hoffman, when he said that there were lost worlds everywhere, was bang on, but I never thought there'd be a lost world up at the top of the Blackpool Tower. But, in a large glass tank, there were two large European eels. I spoke to the curator, who was an old man who'd worked there on and off all his life, and he said that the eels had been there when he had arrived 35 years earlier. 
which would have made it sometime in the mid 60s. European eels have been of great importance to the uh, human race um, economically for thousands of years, but it's only been in the last few decades that we've discovered some of the most important things about their biology, and we're still discovering things about them now. For example, the European eel, we didn't even know where they bred up until the, until the 1940s, and the very closely related Pacific eel from North America, we didn't find where they breed until 2006. They, by the way, breed in the Marianas Trench of the Philippines, and the European eels breed in the deep waters of the Sargasso Sea. Now, the strange thing about European eels is that, the one, although they don't all come into fresh water, about half of the population do come into fresh water where they grow large and when the biological um, imperative kicks in, they swim back down the rivers to the sea and then join their ocean-going brethren and swim down to the Sargasso Sea where they mate, they spawn, they die. And the whole process starts again with teensy little fish called leptocephalus, about the size of my uh, little fingernail, which eventually grow into eels. And the whole story starts again. But sometimes, for whatever reason, the eel is not allowed to go back down to the sea. This happened when the ones that were stuck at the t a big tank at the top of the Blackpool Tower for decades. They stayed there, they couldn't go back down the sea, so they stayed in fresh water, carried on eating, carried on getting larger. These pictures here, I measured them at just over five feet, which is about a foot longer than the generally accepted upper limit for eels in the UK, forgetting uh, the story of Carl, that Carl's father tells and forgetting a couple of other um, not very well documented reports that we found on a fishing website. We're still looking into those. My belief is that for some reason, occasionally eels are sterile and so they don't get the biological imperative and that they stay in fresh water and again get bigger and bigger and bigger until basically they either die of natural causes or they start getting seen by unwitting travellers as being lake monsters. But that, my dear boys and girls, is a totally different story. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon.